Many of the small towns in Bergen County, New Jersey, are considered wealthy suburbs of nearby New York City. But Bergen has a notable city of its own, Hackensack. And just outside downtown is the county's legal district, home to its courthouses, and the Bergen County Jail. Gentlemen, lock into your cell as you comply. You'll be on line out shortly. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art facility. We currently have 277 sworn officers here, as well as uh, 58 civilians. And close to 900 male and female inmates. Most have only been charged with crimes and are awaiting trial at the resolution of their cases. We are here, man. We're in the belly of the beast. Many of those cases are resolved within days, but others can drag on for years. The challenge for those inmates is learning how to cope with monotony and confinement, fear, and anxiety. Some meet the challenge better than others. Inside one of the jail's high security units, inmate Paul Dixon is having a difficult time. Paul. Nobody's hurting you. Just put your hands through so we get you out of here. Dixon is naked in what is known as a single-person special management cell. He was placed there earlier in the day due to erratic behavior. His clothes were replaced with a tear-proof gown to prevent self-injury or suicide. Put your gown on. Originally, he was in a mental health housing unit and was medically cleared through a psychiatrist, and um, he was put in their general population. He lasted about 10 minutes. He was flipping out. They brought him back to medical. They placed him on special management. Put your hands through. Nobody's hurting you. Paul, put the gun on it. Paul, I'm trying to make it easy. You're not going to get hurt. Sergeant Turi has decided to remove Dixon from his cell and place him in a restraint chair so he can be safely evaluated by medical staff. Lift up, Sergeant Turi. Paul, relax. For legal reasons, jail policy is to videotape incidents such as this one. Nobody's hurting you. Listen, nobody's hurting you, okay? Relax. Grab him, Johnny. I got the gloves on. Uh, right intake. to intake. Okay, go right there. Non-violent. Take the intake. Dixon is back in jail on a parole violation. He had been sentenced to 101 days for third-degree theft. He's had prior convictions for theft as well. <laughs> We have to put him in the restraint chair until he calms down, gets evaluated once again by the medical staff, and then we'll take it from there. Paul, well, nobody's hurting you. <laughs> We're here to help you, all right? Relax. I'm not a bad guy. Look at me. Look at me. Nurse is going to come in, check you out. Everything's going to be fine. Relax, man. Relax. It's for the safety of himself, staff, the institution. So it's basically a cooling off period, supervised by custody staff, medical checks him out. Roughly an hour later, the officers return. Dixon has calmed down, and they feel he's now ready to be moved back to his special management cell. You've done your time in the chair. We're going to take you out of the chair. We're going to bring you to South Warren. I want to stay in the chair. Well, it's not what you want. It's not, you don't get what you want. This is, you know... You can't stay in the chair. We have to... I can't be in that room. I'm claustrophobic. I feel crazy in there. I can't breathe. What's going to happen if you go in the room? If you put me, if you put me in medical... And, no, you're not going... In the suit, I won't, I won't say a word. I'm going to sneak, please. I'm scared of that room. It's so small. It's making me feel crazy. It's the same size room. That's the thing I can't... You have a window where you can see the outside. In medical, you have no window. Dixon continues begging to be housed elsewhere, but after several minutes of coaxing, he agrees to return to his cell. Well, like I said, you'll see mental health tomorrow. In a nearby cell is Edwin Estrada, a friend Dixon met during prior stays here. Estrada says he didn't know Dixon was on the unit until he was awakened by his anguished cries. I hopped off the bunk and I, my port was open, so I looked and, and I couldn't really see his face, but I remembered his voice. I'm like, yo, that's Paul Dixon. I know him. Estrada was surprised that Dixon, who's been to jail numerous times before, 
was so distressed. I'm not saying he was faking or anything like that, but sometimes you really do stress out in here. There's people that are not built for this. Estrada is going through some stress of his own. Several weeks earlier, he pled guilty to aggravated manslaughter for killing an 88-year-old World War II veteran. The victim, who lived alone and was killed in his home, was described by his family as a vibrant and active great-grandfather. I really don't want to, like, go to hell for what happened. You know, I'm really afraid, you know. I don't want to spend the rest of the eternity in hell. What had happened was I was smoking angel dust, and I had ended up in uh, one of my friend's grandfather's house. Angel dust, like, gets you really paranoid, and I just went crazy. Like, I lost my mind. I went into the, the kitchen, and I had grabbed the pan. It hit him, I think, twice or three times. The velocity of it was so fast, it was so hard, that um, the pot in itself was bent. It was bent in. I heard him yell, turned around, and I, and I started running. And I remember the only thing I, like, I really do vividly remember was me grabbing like the wallet that he had left on the table. Six days after the attack, Estrada was arrested when he attempted to use one of the victim's credit cards. The man regained consciousness, but died 11 days later in the hospital. He was able to tell authorities that he was sitting on his couch watching TV and was attacked from behind. Estrada was originally charged with first-degree murder. In a deal with prosecutors, he pled down to aggravated manslaughter and was sentenced to 27 years in prison. But then his case took an unusual turn. Estrada's deal was approved by a judge who was sitting in for the presiding judge while she was on vacation. When the presiding judge returned, she overturned the deal. She was swayed by complaints from some of the victim's family members that 27 years was too light a sentence for such a brutal crime. The judge, she's more towards the family. And I understand you have to be sympathetic towards the family. They had stated that I was a monster, that I would go out there and kill somebody again. Estrada will soon return to court to find out if the judge is open to a new plea deal or will make him stand trial for murder, a crime punishable by life in prison. The judge, she just wants me to do life. If he goes to trial, I'm screwed. Coming up. Islam teaches about paradise. That sounds good. Right now, it sounds good. Edwin Estrada seeks a new religion and a talented artist with a gruesome past. When I finished to go, I says, what are I gonna do now? Bergen County, New Jersey, is ranked as one of the most prosperous communities in the United States. But behind the walls of the Bergen County Jail in Hackensack is a very different world. In the maximum security unit, surprise searches for contraband are a regular part of life. Shakedowns here in the Bergen County Jail are performed on a continuous but uh, sporadic basis. It's to kiss the inmates off guard. Spread your legs. I personally don't like that they get too comfortable being anywhere. I consider it my house, you're a visitor. You get in there, you get too comfortable, too bad. We're just looking for contraband, anything that doesn't belong. As you can see, it can easily be used as a weapon. Grab someone from, from behind, maybe choke them. Contraband can go from as far as a weapon, and it also goes to excess. Inmates are able to buy newspapers on commissary. If they have 50 weeks worth of newspapers, it's got to go. These guys are here usually for long term, so they usually accumulate a lot more stuff. Today, Julio Flores will lose some excess items in his cell. Lock it up. Inmates are only allowed two pencils. Anything over that is confiscated. How many pencils do you think you lost here today? All right. I look like a six, seven pencils. It's very important, the pencils. Flores relies on pencils to create his art. It brings a small touch of beauty to an otherwise stark jail cell. He says it's a talent he only discovered in prison. God helped me to draw, and I never draw in that, and this way, God really showed me his favor, even when you are a killer. Flores may believe his art comes from God, 
but says he was on his own five years earlier when he strangled his 28-year-old ex-girlfriend. I remember it's the worst she says, God, give me another chance. While you were choking her? Yeah. I said, God is not here. Flores killed his ex-girlfriend inside his Bronx, New York apartment. He pled guilty to second-degree murder and received a sentence of 19 years to life in a New York State prison. But now he has been extradited to New Jersey to stand trial for a related crime. So why are you in New Jersey? For bringing the members human. The body parts? Body parts, try to hide him. Flores admits that after he murdered his victim, he dismembered her body. When I finished to kill her, and the woman says, what are I gonna do now? Because something on me come in my mind and says, you know what? Now you gotta disappear the body. Flores placed the body parts inside plastic bags and drove them to a vacant home in Bergen County, New Jersey. He then placed the bags inside buckets. How many buckets? Four buckets plus the big buckets, five buckets for all. I used the cement too, concrete, to put, you know, all, all over in the, in, the, in the buckets. The owner of the house happened to stop by, found Flores in the front yard, and questioned him. And I said, listen, man, I got somebody there. So look at me, what? Yeah, I killed my ex-girlfriend yesterday. Now, in addition to his conviction for second-degree murder, Flores is charged in Bergen County with desecration of human remains. Though he's openly admitted to the act, this time he's pled not guilty and will soon stand trial. He says God led him to that decision. Why are you always smiling in the newspapers? In the moment, he forgave me my sins, and I feel all my guilt is out of me. I am so happy. I don't live with bad memories no more. I believe she's already free. God is love. While Flores may face incarceration for the rest of his life, Paul Abdul Wiggins hopes that his days in jail are nearing an end. How much time have you done in this jail? About 31 years. 31 years. On. Yeah. All right, so you got 19 years on me. Yeah. Wiggins has pretty much been a regular at Bergen County since age 18. The jail no longer has his earliest mugshots on record. But Wiggins says whether the conviction was for robbery, theft, possession, or dealing, all his crimes have centered around a voracious drug addiction. So this is every time Mr. Wiggins has ever been incarcerated in this facility, and it's 10, 20, 30, about 40 times. When he first comes in, he's always it's on edge. Yeah, because he's, he's, he's high usually yeah. when he comes in. Coming off know? of drugs, he's kicking taking drugs. He doesn't want to talk, he doesn't mm -hmm. want to be bothered, he wants to be left alone. He's agitated. So he's, you know, he's dope sick. And then uh, once he comes around, he thaws out. <laughs> he's usually pretty good. He's, he's one of our frequent flyers, you know? Wiggins says that after all these years, he's finally had enough. Next year, I'll be 50 years old, man. Uh, this, is, this is the time that I'm, 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 I'm really starting to wake up right. to all the things that I've been through in life. And I'm finally at, at that stage, stage where I see things so much clearer, man. I mean, a whole lot clearer. Wiggins is currently in jail on his latest drug possession conviction. This time, his judge gave him a choice. Either serve five years in prison or enter a long-term residential drug rehab program. Upon completion, he would be released on probation. Wiggins is working with staff to get placed into a program, but until then, he must remain in jail. You know, sometimes it's difficult, man, to explain to people, you know, like how many times I've been in and out of this system. And it's, it's sad, really. Now you see a guy that's anxious for change. You know, I never thought I would live to see 30, but I'm here. I have a beautiful granddaughter that I'm crazy about. I want to be there.
when she graduates high school. I want to be there when she go to college and graduate. I wasn't there for my daughter. And when I think about it, it hurts. And she didn't deserve that. I was afraid to change at one time because I was so comfortable being where I was at. It just became an everyday routine. But now I'm willing to take that challenge. Wiggins, who works as an inmate food server, has spent so much time at Bergen County, he's seen staff come and go and advance up the ranks. You know, there's lieutenants, captains, wardens. They was officers when I first started coming in. LT! Paul, what's up? 25 years ago, Paul Akekios was a rookie here. Now, Lieutenant Akekios is one of the jail's highest ranking officers. He's known Wiggins his entire career and says the younger version was a handful. It was a fight. Everything was a fight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be standing like this with, with each yeah. other those years. We'd be, we'd be fighting, rolling around on the ground. And it took him a while. Uh, but I do believe that everybody should be given an opportunity. And, and uh, he told me, he said he never had an opportunity. So he's getting one now. And I think that if he walks the walk, because he's talking the talk, he'll make it. Yeah, I do. Coming up. OK, why are you picking these programs? The program has a lot to offer me. Paul Abdul Wiggins pleads his case to a skeptical staff person. I promise you, I will not help you at all. And officers get to the bottom of Paul Dixon's breakdown. <laughs> Behind the walls of Hackensack, New Jersey's Bergen County Jail, <laughs> Paul Dixon recently had what appeared to be an emotional breakdown. He had just spent time in the mental health unit for a routine evaluation before being released to general population. A short time later, he began wailing and was placed in a restraint chair. No, you're not going... In the suit, I won't, I won't say a word. I'm going to sleep, please. I'm scared of that room. It's so small. <laughs> Dixon later calmed down and returned to his cell. And now... Officers have determined the episode was not a breakdown, but an act of manipulation. He definitely is manipulating the system. He was comfortable in the mental health housing unit. And once he was cleared for general population, uh, he realized that it wasn't too comfortable over there. So now he's doing his best to get reevaluated and get put back in a mental health housing. How much was real and how much was fake? Um, all of it was fake, basically. I just, it was like a whole act that I was doing. Why? So I could just get to the other housing unit. So I wouldn't have to come to either here or go to the general population. It's not uncommon for inmates to want to spend time in the mental health unit. There are no cells, fewer inmates, and it's a quieter setting. I just like it to be quiet, where I could watch TV. You're a heck of an actor. Thank you. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people throw temper tantrums before, say that they're hearing voices and suicidal and all that. <laughs> if you're gonna do something, you gotta play it out to the fullest. While officers say they won't take risks if an inmate appears to be in a state of distress, it's not the first time they've heard one cry wolf. You just kind of get to know after a while who's pretty much playing a game and who's for real, you know? you just kind of becomes like a spidey sense, I guess, so to speak, you know? Dixon never made it back to the mental health unit, but he says he's glad to be free of the restraint chair. Trust me, nobody could get out of that car seat. Not the best of the best of the best. I don't care if you're Houdini, you can't get out of that thing. While inmates in this housing unit are only released from their cells a few at a time, they can visit with each other when they are out. Scoop, Polly. What's up, man? Now Dixon's old friend, Edwin Estrada, has dropped by. Yeah, you was going crazy, bro. Earlier, That's man. what woke me up. I was, I was sleeping. You got, you was going berserk, bro. I know. Freaking pulled you out naked and since you know, little wiener and <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Yeah, people... Estrada, who admitted to killing an 88-year-old World War II veteran with a kitchen pan, is awaiting a court hearing to find out if he will be allowed a new plea deal or must stand trial for murder. His original plea deal was overturned by a judge for being too lenient. First offer was 27 years, and I signed for it. But she took it back. 
Like, and what did, what did they talk about giving you? Life. Are you serious? Yeah, bro. Yeah, they can't give you life for that. Yeah, they could, bro. It's a murder, bro. Somebody how old, died. How old was the dude? He was old. Estrada has confessed to killing the man, a fact he knows could hurt him in trial and possibly result in a life sentence if found guilty. But he's equally concerned about what awaits afterlife. I really don't want to, like, go to hell for what happened. You know, I'm really afraid. I don't want to spend my rest of the eternity in hell. I'm worried at what's going to happen after my death. We're all going to die one day, but it's like, where are you going to go? You know what I'm saying? Estrada was raised Catholic, but says now he's trying something new, the religion of Islam. You know how you window shop? That I'm religion shopping. So you're just going to go through every religion possible to see which one? Maybe, maybe that, whichever one I'm hungry for, you know. And of late, Estrada has been hungry quite a bit. It is the start of the Muslim holiday of Ramadan, which requires followers to fast every day until sundown for an entire month. Hey, you supposed to be fasting. You ain't I'm fasting. I never ate that bologna sandwich. Wait. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you can ask them to 25, because I meant to ask them, like, you're my witness. I never ate that bologna sandwich. I feel more towards peace with Islam, because for some reason, it, it's helped me settle my anger sometimes. And then Islam teaches about paradise. Right now, it sounds good. I really don't want to go to hell. Let's sit down, bro. Coming up. You told me you want to be Muslim. I said, ah, it's fine. You act, you know. Yeah, I'm just too immature. It's just the bottom line. Edwin Estrada struggles with his new religion. And the jury returns a verdict for Julio Flores. I'm so happy. Really, I'm so happy. Something touched me here. Due to mature subject matter, viewer discretion is advised. The original Bergen County Jail, completed in 1912, looked more like an ominous castle compared to its modern replacement, which opened next door in 2000. Oh, Paul Abdul Wiggins is one of the few inmates whose long record of coming in and out of jail spans both facilities. But I'm a man of my word, so I gotta keep my word. That's all I got. Wiggins has had more than 40 stays at the jail on a litany of drug, theft, and robbery convictions that he says all stem from addiction. I used to sniff heroin and coke. It was something that I allowed myself to like when I should have been hating it at, at, at all times. Now a 49-year-old grandfather, Wiggins says he wants to change. I asked my creator to erase this taste from my mouth take this taste away from me. I believe I'm strong enough now to, to fight that demon that's inside of me. Wiggins' opportunity lies in his sentence for his latest drug possession charge. His judge has told him he can either serve five years in a state prison or enter an approved drug rehabilitation program at a halfway house and stay clean. I think that somewhere in, in his life, he's reached a, an epiphany, if you will. He realizes he can't do this. You can't do this your whole life, you know, or else you wind up dying in here, or, and, or your family dies while you're in here. And I think that that's become very real to him as he's gotten older. Wiggins' ability to get into a drug program lies with Don Breeden, who has tried to help him in the past without much luck. All right, I'm going to see Mr. Wiggins. Breeden is the jail's inmate advocate. Part of her job is matching inmates with community resources. But Breeden has a problem with Wiggins' request. He's Islamic and he wants to go into a Christian program. That's a problem. I know from my past experience, if someone who is of a different religion goes into a Christian program, they usually have a problem following the spiritual guidance there. So that's why I want to find him someplace that will be more amenable to his faith. If you look at it, stop looking at half of the picture. I'm not looking at I'm half. Looking I'm looking at, at the whole of, picture. No, you're not, then. Yes, I am. Well, you're not seeing like I'm seeing that. Right, that's the whole problem. You ain't been seeing it right for the past how many years? Oh, now, y'all, that was a low blow. That was... That you, was ju you just that said was it. was below the belt. Still, I really don't. Okay, why are you picking these programs? Why? Because mm -hmm. the program has a lot to offer me. But the foundation that your faith is built on, the foundation 
Okay. That's the only thing we can do. But it's your foundation. But you know what? I don't want to go there, Ms. Dawn. Because that's my old stomping grounds. Okay. I'm too familiar with all that. I need to be somewhere where I don't know nobody. I don't know where I'm going. Everyone wants to see him try harder this time. And like he said, he's done this before. So I want to you know, give him a good start. I'm going to call the Salvation Army program. I'm going to ask them if they will accept someone who is Islamic. If they say no, I'm going to let them know to take him off their list. Now, if you come back here again, under any circumstance, I promise you, I will not help you at all. No matter how many lieutenants, captains, or anybody comes and says, you're going to help him, right? You know the sad part about it? I believe you. No, I'm telling you the truth. I know. I'm telling you the truth. I believe you. Yeah, okay. I believe you. As Wiggins waits to find out if he will be accepted into the program, continues his job as a food server. And this week, that might be more challenging than usual. Wiggins is observing the month-long Islamic holiday of Ramadan and must fast until sundown. He converted to Islam during a jail state 10 years earlier and took the name Abdul. Abdul means servant. That's it means servant, like serving God. When I'm living right and I'm doing right and I'm on the straight and narrow path, I'm God's servant. That's why I chose that name. About 10% of the inmate population is Muslim. And for those who request it, the jail provides halal meals, which meet the religion's dietary requirements. It's, it's prayed over, it's blessed. You know, like the kosher, that's what makes it special, because it's prayed over, it's blessed. We got to wait another, for another, at least an hour. So I know Estrada, he can't wait. Look at him, he can't wait to eat. Edwin Estrada says he embraced the religion because, among other things, he fears going to hell as taught by his Catholic upbringing. Islamic inmate Melsi Pio has served as a mentor, but says he has to keep an eye on Estrada. You got to watch him because he say, he asked me for a canteen. I'm going to fast. Let me get some uh, honey bun. I said, OK, <laughs> here. But you got to fast. Estrada hoped he would find peace in Islam. But now he's not so sure he's cut out for it. I just thought I'm not going to do it. I've been telling you that. It's, you know, it, nobody can force you uh, religion to you. You know, I've been, I've been telling you that. You know, it, you, you wanted to, you told me you want to be a Muslim. I said, ah, it's fine. But, but then you act. Old, you know, yeah, I'm too immature. It's just, so. just too immature. It's just the bottom yeah, so, line. Yeah. I can't wake up every day at four, do wudu, wash my hands, wash my face, wash my feet, wash you know everything, and then pray, and then I gotta do it again three hours later, and then I, you know all of that, and yeah. then it's just too much discipline for me. You know, it's just I don't. I'm done with that. I don't want to act like I'm somebody that I'm not no more. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not gonna do it. You, you you're just, you're not gonna you catch just, me praying you just answer, at four. You just answered my entire time I was telling you. Look, you're not gonna catch me at four a.m. praying one day, facing that way. See what I'm saying? See, it's not even that way. It's, it's this, this way. You're right. My fault. It's been a while since I prayed. <laughs> you probably never did. Outside the unit, Wiggins continues his food delivery route. He only delivers trays to the door of each housing unit, and that's a big relief especially when it comes to one unit. I just bring it to this, this door, and that's it. It's a wrap. I don't go in there. Lockdown, Max. That's, that's Max right there. Them are killers in there. I'm not a killer. One of those convicted killers is Julio Flores. After strangling his ex-girlfriend inside his Bronx, New York apartment, he pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 19 years to life in a New York State prison. Because Flores was actually arrested in New Jersey, with the woman's body parts concealed inside buckets, he was extradited to Bergen County to stand trial on an additional charge, desecration of human remains. And earlier today, it took a jury less than two hours to find him guilty. So tell me about when you first heard the verdict and what your reaction was. <laughs> you don't gonna believe me, because I'm so happy, really, I'm so happy something touched me in. I can explain that I, I, I feel like happy. 
I can explain. I was out of this world, and all people look at me, look at me like crazy. You're at peace? Yeah. I'm right in the, in the hands of God. Flores was sentenced to 20 years in the New Jersey State Prison System, which he will only serve if he is ever released from prison in New York. Ironically, he could serve a longer sentence for desecrating his ex-girlfriend's body than he will for murdering her. Are you so sure, though, that you've been forgiven for your crime, and how? Of course. Do you think you'll see your victim in heaven? Uh, this is not a fan of me. Do you want to see her in heaven? If he got one, it's all right. What would you say to her? What are you going to say to her if I say to heaven? I think everybody, when they go to the, he to the heaven, is already forgiven, so you don't need to ask for forgiveness. Just hold and love him. They said, like, God loved you, and that's it. What are you going to say? Oh, I'm sorry for killed you or something? No, you don't need it, because it's already done. Coming up. Inmate Strada came to me earlier about feeling depressed. He suggested that if the inmate Sanchez can be his bunkie, Edwin Estrada requests some company, but might receive more than he bargained for. I've never seen anyone clean like that man cleans. If I was able to take him home, I would take him home and allow him to clean my house, because that's how good of a cleaner he is in here. Paul Dixon's apparent breakdown turned out to be nothing more than a ruse to get moved to a better housing unit. And if you're being medical, then no, you're not going. in the suit, I won't, I won't say a word, I won't But officers saw through the hoax and returned Dixon to his cell. Now he's on his way back to general population and says he's changed his tune. He's also gotten his clothes back. Yes, I was in the chicken suit, graduated back to the orange uniform, you know, behaved. They're pretty good. How does it feel to be in this? Much better. I learned that if I ever do come back, which I'm not going to come back to jail, I'm going to do it the right way and just take it like a man, you know? It's not, it's not worth it putting these guys through all it's types of hell, you know? Dixon is in jail on a probation violation for third-degree theft, but will soon be going home. I went to court today, and they granted me time served and they terminated my probation. So I'm waiting a little bit, probably another hour or so. I should be going home, you know? And now I can see my kids, see my family again, and work my way up, get back into school, and be successful, and accomplish things in life. I'm too old to be coming to jail, so take that advice and don't come to jail. Dixon's friend, Edwin Estrada, faces the possibility of never living in the free world again. He will soon appear in court to learn if his judge will entertain another plea deal or order him to stand trial for allegedly killing an elderly man with a kitchen pan. I really do feel bad for what happened. Inside, I, it's hard to live with. At first, when I first got here, I was, sort of I was sort of in denial. I was like, you know what, I don't need to be here. But in the back of my head, I'm like, somebody died. I need to pay for what happened. Like, that's the reality of things. I messed up so much in my life that sometimes it's like, could it get any worse, you know? I really don't think it can get any worse from now. I don't want to say that I jinx myself, but that's how I feel. Here, Estrada. Good luck. Uh -huh. Estrada had hoped that his conversion to Islam would help relieve his stress. But he recently decided that it wasn't for him. So now, he's looking for other ways to cope. I don't know, I feel like I need a, a bunkie. I just losing my mind, being by myself. You want company sometimes. You need somebody to talk to, to express how you feel. M.A. Strada came to me earlier about feeling depressed, not talking to anybody. He suggested if inmate Sanchez can be his bunkie. If it helps Estrada out any way, then, then helps me out because, uh, you know, I got a lot of things going on. Sanchez. We don't want any suicide attempts and stuff like that. Get okay, your stuff. You're going 48. Now? Yeah. I need to clean the room. The room is dirty. No, he clean. He clean? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Wilfredo Sanchez is known at the jail for being clean. Very clean. I've never seen anyone clean like that man cleans. Yeah, I was going to clean the whole room because the Sanchez needs to come in. You know, I'm gonna clean the cell up before he moves in, you know? Cause like, my mom always told me like, when you clean, it has a, 
my cleaner energy and stuff, like, and feel better and stuff. Do you have any concerns about them bunking together? No, not at all, because um, Sanchez, he's a good worker. And Strada, sometimes he still gets depressed every once in a while, and they can watch each other. But shortly after Sanchez moves in, there's a problem. He wanted, he thought the room was yeah, good, but he, right he didn't give me a chance to scrub the floor, yeah, clean the bathroom. Clean, you know? So we gotta do that when we come out right now, so. It's crazy, you stole your room. We gotta clean, that's it. What? That's the depression, though. You see my toilet? No, like he's, that, he's, in my sink, too. He's the cleanest man you, on the You street. see my toilet in, my, in the sink? No, like that, bro. It makes Sanchez is a unit worker. We need to keep the units as clean as possible. And he does the best job out of all of the workers that we have. So I use him as often as I can. He'll go in and he'll scrub from ceiling to floor. And I mean, wets the ceiling, the walls, and then he takes the squeegee and he squeegees the whole cell down. The bunks get clean, the, all the metal gets clean. Wow. So my shampoo, but the smell is good. I'm telling you, when he leaves, it's clean. I even allow him to clean the officer's bathroom because he does such a good job. If I was able to take him home, I would take him home and allow him to clean my house because that's how good of a cleaner he is in here. My mom tell me, say, Willie, where's your room? Your room clean? Very clean? My mom, yes. And what is the toilet? Very clean. So, Edwin, did you count on this? Nah, I didn't. It smells like a rat dying in here. Coming up. I'm working trying to get something like 15 to 20. I just want you to be realistic. A counselor tries to temper Edwin Estrada's high hopes before he heads to court to learn his fate. And two of my greatest fears is me dying in prison and my mother passing my money. I don't ever want that to happen. Paul Abdul Wiggins stares reality right in the face. Compared to prison where the inmates have all been sentenced and know how long they will serve, life in jail is a world of uncertainty. But nearly every day, resolution arrives for someone. We're gonna take you out of the chair and we're gonna bring you to South Warren. I can't be in that room and close the phone because you're crazy in there. I can't. Paul Dixon put on a show in order to manipulate his housing assignment. Now, listen, I'm telling you right now, you're going to South One, and if you cause problems, you're gonna end up back in the chair. It didn't work. But one month after that incident, he's a free man. Paul Dixon, he violated probation for the original charge of third degree theft and was released yesterday. Dixon will still be on probation, but now he has another chance to make it on the outside. The future seems less bright for his friend, Edwin Estrada. After admitting to killing an 88-year-old man by striking him numerous times with a kitchen pan, Estrada's plea deal of 27 years was revoked by a judge who decided the sentence was too lenient. Estrada is hopeful for a new plea deal, but he also faces the possibility of going to trial for murder and a potential life sentence if found guilty. Helping him through it is mental health clinician Jackie Gill. Because Edwin is facing very serious charges and his case has taken some twists and turns that we didn't expect, I've been seeing him the whole time he's been here. Good morning. We've just worked with the possibility of life. That's the reality that he is going to prison for a long time. So to skirt around that issue would do him a disservice. I'm a new attorney and stuff. I'm working trying to get something like 15 to 20 with this new attorney. That would be a lot different than I'd be happy. what we I, planned I, I for. I wouldn't be past. happy to tell you the truth. I would be content. How realistic? Do you think that option is the lower? The end? lower number? I just want you to be, and you know we've talked about this all the time, is being realistic to right. what the situation is and realistic of all the possible outcomes. Yeah. So, you know, whereas 15 to 20 would be great, we've also talked about 28 and we've also talked about 40 and life. That's crazy. It is crazy, I'm, but. There's no way I'm, I'm gonna accept the plea deal for 40. I might as well go to trial. Mm -hmm. You know, that's crazy. I'm not gonna do that. Like you say, you have to be realistic. At the same time, I need to look at both sides, you know what I'm saying? I have to look at being realistic, and at the same time, I have to look at being um, hopeful and stuff. There's always hope, but
but it's a slippery slope because you don't want to bash their hope or hinder their hope, but you got to balance it with the reality. Hopefully, I'll, hopefully go, everything goes well because I can't do, I can't do life. Like, The next day, Estrada leaves jail for the court hearing that will change the rest of his life. The victim's family, I guess they want me to do life. If I was in their position, I could see where they're coming from, but um, I just don't think you know, I deserve to do life. Just before he enters the courtroom, Estrada is summoned to a private meeting with his attorney, where he will presumably learn his fate. Moments later, he has his answer. There is no deal today. They want to bring me to trial, and I'm fine with that, you know? I thought earlier you said you weren't. I guess I can't do anything about it, so I have to be, I have to accept the fact that I'm going to trial. If I lose, I end up getting probably life. Estrada was 18 when he was arrested for this case. Watch your step, gentlemen, watch your step. The same age as Paul Abdul Wiggins when he first came to jail on an armed robbery charge. That was 31 years ago, and Wiggins has been in and out of jail 40 times since then. But he says now he's finally ready to take advantage of the opportunity afforded him to do better. Though she had some concerns about his Muslim faith being a good fit, inmate advocate Don Breeden was able to place Wiggins in a Christian-based halfway house where he will receive drug counseling, job training, and life skills programs. Today, the lieutenant called me down and informed me that I was going into the program and I should be leaving sometime next week. So I'm just hoping the program is right for me and, and, and it do me some good because uh, this ain't doing me nothing. And this is your first program. All the years you've been going through us and coming through here, this is the first time you're ready for a program. Two of my greatest fears is me dying in prison and my mother passing while I'm in here. I don't ever want that to happen. That's motivation. So, before I start... Go ahead, go ahead, my man. Gotta be good, right? All right. Hey.